So uh, thank you very much for uh, joining me today. I'm going to talk about uh, Apache Tika 2X uh, and some of the improvements we've been making on that uh, to help it uh, be more robust and to scale well. And I can tell from the chat, nobody's complaining that you can't hear me, so off we go. All right, so I'm a uh, subcontractor data scientist out at uh, Jet Propulsion Laboratory um, at the California Institute of Technology. I'm also the chair of Apache Tika and a committer on uh, PDF Box POI and a couple of other uh, important projects at ASF. In a former life, I was a uh, professor of Latin and ancient Greek. All right, so first uh, we're going to look at um, an overview of Tika generally. Um, uh, it's a, as, as you know, if you've come to this talk, probably it's a framework for file type detection. It parses all sorts of different file formats and then uh, parse, uh, gives an output, a uniform output so that uh, individual users don't have to worry about, um, uh, you know, different uh, formats and other, other uh, peculiarities of, of file formats. Uh, so it tries to give uniform input, uniform output, so that uh, everybody's job is easier for search systems, natural language processing, all, all sorts of other things. Tika is the system that gets people from bytes to text and metadata so they can do more, uh, more fun things. All right. So um, one, some things that got me into Tika. One, it's very easy to add new file types uh, for detection. It's fairly easy to add new parsers. What really got me into Tika, though, is that it works recursively with embedded files and attachments. So when I first started doing this, I thought, oh, I've got a PDF file, I'll run PDF to text on that, or a Word file, I'll run um, anti-Word on it or something like that. But then when I started dealing with files more and more, I realized that a bunch of files that I didn't think were container files could actually have embedded attachments. And that's where I found having Tika as a framework for dealing with all of those is, is really important. Um, the other fun thing is that we have an integration with Tesseract OCR. So even for images or uh, image-only PDFs, uh, we'll fire off uh, Tesseract uh, so you can get some text out of it. Not perfect, but, but pretty good. And this is an example of what I mean by embedded attachments. I, I have actually seen these things in the wild. Um, you can stick a zip file inside of zip file inside of zip file and then throw that all into a Microsoft Word document. Uh, when the, the output of that ideally would be some kind of uh, parent child or perhaps a uh, flattened view of it in open search or solar or elastic search. Um, so in this talk today, I'll talk about getting from the bytes to uh, something uh, structured with um, extracted text and uh, metadata. All right, so first I'll talk about the status. I'll go over some of the highlights of Tika 2X. I'll talk about motivation for Tika pipes. Um, crashing JVMs at scale, and then I'll uh, go into the, the Tika Pipes module, which is a major new contribution uh, to Tika and, and how it integrates with other uh, big data frameworks. All right, so we actually got we got 2.0 alpha out in the beginning of 2021, and we've been releasing bits and bits. Uh, we finally got 2.1.0 out in August of 2021, and I think that's fairly stable. I don't think there are any massive uh, things that have to be changed or fixed. Uh, in that, there are some things that we want to fix, but nothing awful. Um, so I think it's it's getting ready to to be moved to production if you are uh, if you are game. Uh, the first thing, the first major change that we made is we have Maven modularized all the things. So we haven't gone full jigsaw, but we've at least started modularizing things in Maven. Um, the goal of this is so that you don't have to pull in all of the parsers if you know you don't want to deal with some esoteric uh, file formats. Uh, we've tried to have kind of a Tika parser standard, which is where you know the parsers that we think everybody would want to use uh, in the Tika standard Tika parser standard module. Then we have the extended one, which have uh, some heavier dependencies. They may require uh, external resources, network calls, um, and the par parsers may have uh, native libs. And then the third level of parsers is par uh, Tika parsers machine learning or ML. And that has super heavy dependencies like uh, DL4J. So even within the Tika parser standard, um, we've broken those up into sub-modules um, so that if you really, really, really only know that you're going to be parsing HTML, you don't have to bring in all of the other PDF parsing and everything else. Um, typically, Tika parser standard is probably what most people will want to use. In extended, we have the scientific module, which has GDAL, uh, GRIB, ISOTAB, NetCDF, and so on. And then also we have the separate module for SQLite 3, because that uses native libs. And we've, a number of people have complained uh, previously when we put native libs in with, uh, in with Tika. So that's a separate um, module. Tika parsers ML has a bunch of different uh, machine learning integrations uh, with Tika. 
Right. And we also now have, uh, thanks to Lewis McGivney, um, uh, uh, automatic speech recognition, recognition uh, called uh, it's the transcribe AWS um, uh, interface that, that links to AWS's transcribe uh, framework. All right. So Tika app uh, is the same as before, except that it only comes with Tika parser standard. So it no longer comes with the scientific uh, parsers or uh, the SQLite um, parser. Uh, the same is also true for Tika Server. Um, we've modularized that. So there's Tika Server Core that actually comes with no parsers so that if you don't want to have any heavy dependencies in, in Tika Server, you know you only want to parse a couple of file types in there. You can drop your parsers on the class path and you're good to go. Tika Server Standard comes with the standard parsers, um, but you have to add the scientific format parsing or the submodules for SQLite 3 if you want those uh, uh, file types handled. Um, yeah, so Tika Server, as I mentioned, has been modularized. So we have Core and Classic. Classic comes with the Classic parsers. Uh, or I'm sorry, Classic. <laughs> I haven't gotten around to changing the slide yet. Here. Sorry, that should be Tika Server Standard. Tika Server Standard comes with um, uh, Tika Server Core plus the standard parsers. We've also modularized the Lang Detect so that you don't have to pull in all of the dependencies for all of the other language detectors if you only want to use one of them. We also modularized uh, Tika Eval uh, and um, that will allow you to uh, do some kind of an uh, evaluation of the content that you got out of your, uh, that was extracted from the file. It will give you total tokens, total alphabetic tokens. Uh, we run language ID on uh, the text that was pulled out and we count um, uh, the number of common words. And let me go over that a little bit. So we took the th top 20,000 most common words from 120 some on languages and we store those. When we extract text, if you have the Tika eval core jar on your path, um, it will uh, it'll tokenize the text that was extracted, uh, do language identification on that, and then do, uh, cal do calculate the ratio of how many words were extracted for that detected language versus how many were not in the common words list for that language. So for example, on the same file in Tika 114, um, it looks like Chinese. If you can read Chinese, this is not Chinese, but if it, it's complete junk. Um, the out of vocabulary statistic on that is 100%, which means that it's there were no dictionary terms in there at all. Whereas when we made a slight change to encoding detection, uh, that changed to um, something that looks like German. And we now have an out of vocabulary of 54%, which is kind of closer to what you would expect for um, for natural language. So that metric's not perfect, um, but it is. it can be a good indicator that something's going horribly wrong. Here's an example of text is stored in a PDF file. Um, and if you get a low OOV, you may want to run um, OCR on that. In this case, OCR comes out with some pretty decent text. Whereas if you had simply relied on extracting text from that file and put that into your index, uh, things might not have go as expected. Um, so anyway, this uh, Tika eval is a really nice module that I'd like to get more people using. It's critical uh, for identifying when uh, you get garbage stored in PDFs or when encoding detection goes wrong in HTML. Uh, it has a number of really important uses. All right, so now I will talk about crashing JVMs at scale with credit to Nick Birch, good colleague on a couple of these uh, projects. So bad things happen, um, and lots of different things can happen. One is uh, you can hit uh, memory errors. We can have infinite loops, slow building memory leaks. We can crash. We had one uh, parser which called system exit if it didn't like a particular byte. Um, you can also, Tika can also spin up so much that the um, operating system's OOM killer kicks in. Uh, there can be malicious code, we can have runaway forked processes, all, all sorts of awful things can happen. They don't happen that often, um, but if you're processing billions of files that you don't, you don't trust the sources of those files, if it's just stuff off the internet, things do happen. So we're trying to make Tika, uh, we can't guarantee how robu the robustness of our dependencies. Um, or even some of our parsers sometimes, but we can try to encapsulate uh, the um, control the blast <laughs> radius uh, of, of some of the parsers. So that's I'll talk shortly about how we're doing that. But just to set the stage and to go into this a little bit more, it's not just Tika. Um, if all isolation, security boundaries, these are all really good things to do um, just from an engineering um, perspective. Parsing particularly is dangerous. Dangerous. Um, this is uh, from a keynote at um, the LangSec workshop uh, this summer um, by Kathleen Fisher, um, just talking about how parsing is really dangerous and needs to be done carefully. Um, it's really quite dangerous. And again, this is also from her talk. 80% of CVEs are in code that handles input data. Um, number one, uh, improper neutralization of input during web page generation. Number three is input, improper input validation. A thousand parser bugs in, in Mozilla. 
of parsing is really, really dangerous and is notoriously dangerous. It's not just Tika. Um, <laughs> and these are actual uh, exploits that have uh, attacked, uh, whose part of the attack chain is driven by, um, by font parsers in this case. Um, this was a major uh, campaign that was revealed, uh, I think, over the, over the summer. And four of those are from, from four of those steps are uh, vulnerabilities in font parsers. For Sentry, which you may have heard of in the news, um, relies on uh, a parser bug in the JVIG2 parser. Uh, the wrapper files are uh, uh, PSD and PDF, but the underlying uh, JVIG2 parser was the real um, uh, uh, vulnerability in this attack. So again, its parsers across the landscape are uh, vulnerable. The other thing uh, to think about is how does your pipeline handle um, uh, problems in parsing and, and content extraction? Um, Martin White, a good uh, Twitter uh, friend, um, writes, uh, a rogue document might bring the process to a halt. Let me just say that if you have a rogue document that can bring your process to a halt, it's time to re-engineer all that you're doing because that should never happen. And there are rogue documents in the world and you really need to make sure that you're um, that your pipelines are robust against that. Uh, yeah, so this is this was one of the things that got me interested in um, in, in the security aspect of Apache Tika. Somebody uh, found that they couldn't couldn't just do a regular kill uh, when they were parsing a specific file. They had to do a kill nine. Um, that finally took care of it. But users really shouldn't have to do this kind of thing. Uh, Tika should should be able to encapsulate uh, the, the parsers so that users don't have to deal with this. And in, in the rest of the talk, I'll talk about some of the ways that we're doing that uh, to help you. And yes, we do have parsers that have hit infinite loops. Uh, we will have them again, I can almost guarantee it. And are infinite loops really that bad? Yes, yes, they are They're really bad and they go on forever. Um, one of the things in the classic uh, Tika server uh, module is that if you send a file that causes an infinite loop in Tika server, uh, even when the client connection closes, uh, if you're timing it out on the client connection, the parser will still continue to go in the background in Tika server. Um, so let me tell you about some of the things we're doing to protect against that in Tika 2.0. Overall, our goal, as Ted Dunning said, is, is to be boring. We want Tika to be so boring that you won't even come to a talk on Tika anymore because it just works. Um, of course, that's not going to happen in my lifetime, um, but uh, it, it, we do want to make it boring. Tika parsing files should not be an exciting thing. All right, so some things that we've done to mitigate uh, catastrophe in Tika. Uh, we have a reporting page. Um, we do some code reviews and forks of external dependencies. Uh, we, we've, we've forked a number of things where the projects are no longer maintained and there are a couple of easy fixes we could do. So we forked those and, and, fi and fixed them. Uh, for some of those, mercifully, we have found um, completely different libraries to handle those file formats. So we've gotten rid of those forks, some of those forks in 2x, which is great. Um, we've started a file format aware fuzzing module. I am not a fuzzer, um, but I've already found some amazing things with just some rudimentary fuzzing. So why not? Uh, for real fuzzing, go to the people who know what they're doing. Don't, don't use our module. But it, it has found a number of really important bugs already. Um, we have a regression, uh, we have several regression corpora. Uh, we have about two terabytes, two million files uh, gathered from Common Crawl and uh, GovDocs1. Uh, those are currently publicly hosted. We're in discussion about whether that's going to be going on much longer, um, whether we can publicly host them or not. Uh, but we do have a bunch of files. And before we run, before we make a release of Tika, we run uh, Tika against those files and find out, um, identify if there are, uh, you know, losses in content uh, or um, crashes, uh, OOMs, uh, timeouts, uh, or, or other surprises. So we have a pretty good sized uh, collection of files now. And that file collection is also used by PDF Box uh, and POI. And um, it has a, a number of, of interesting files in it. All right. The other thing we have is a mock parser, um, and we have we've added fake load to that so that you can, um, if you load in the Tika test jar into your class path, you can send a an XML file that will say throw an OOM, and when the parser hits that file, it will throw an OOM. So this is a really useful thing to have in your pipeline so that you can test whether your pipeline is uh, robust against OOM system exits, crashes, uh, other awful things that can happen. Obviously, you do not want the test jar and the class path in production, uh, but for testing, this is a really useful um, uh, method of, of identifying how well your uh, pipeline is working, how well it can handle uh, problematic files. All right, so some options to avoid catastrophe. 
Um, we have, we've had the fork parser for a long time that forks a, uh, 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 spawned process, which does the parsing. Um, it's a little bit complex and does some fairly advanced and interesting things that don't allow for as much flexibility as some of the other stuff, which I'll be talking about. Uh, Tika batch, if you're running at this point, um, from file share or at the point of the writing of these, um, file share to file share, uh, just call Tika app with the I for input directory O for output directory, and it'll run, um, robustly. It also forks a, a child process that, that does the parsing for you. Um, Tika server, and I'll talk about that in greater detail in the next slides. Um, and then I'll talk about the pipes parser also in the coming slides. The notion with the pipes parser is similar to the fork parser, uh, but it expands that notion uh, and, and adds uh, connectivity to uh, S3, um, Solar, Elasticsearch, and a bunch of other things. And I'll talk about that uh, in much greater detail. So first, let me talk about uh, the evolution of... Um... <laughs> Thank you, Daniel. Yes, parsing files is exciting. Um, anyway, so yeah, the evolution of uh, Tika server. All right, so in the beginning, um, this is what it looked like. Um, there was an Apache, T so the, that's the JVM boundary in blue, and um, a client would send some bytes to, uh, to Tika server, and that could blow up. Um, if it was a crash, uh, system exit or OOM or something fatal, or the operating system killed the process, um, it would just go down and never come back up. So that meant that the client was responsible for making sure that um, they had a, a Sentinel to, to turn it back on. However, what was really bad about that setup is that there, if there was an infinite loop or a slow building memory leak or out of memory errors, which could hinder, which could cause problems for, um, which could cause memory corruption, users never knew about those things. Um, so Tika server would keep going, but things could be really wrong in the background. So what we added uh, in Tika 1, well, uh, probably two or three years ago by now, probably more, was the spawn child option. And what that did was um, it had a, a monitoring process which forked the actual server. And then if somebody sent something that made it blow up, um, the monitoring service would restart it uh, so that the users would the clients would notice that Tika server has gone down temporarily uh, and have, they would have to adjust for that, uh, but it would come back up automatically uh, and it would do that on, uh, on infinite loops. It would do that on, um, on out of memory and other things that weren't caught that an outsider wouldn't be able to see uh, without the spawn child mode. So spawn child mode has become the default in Tika server in 2X. Uh, you can do, I think um, the command is no fork. So if you do not want what was called spawn child, um, as the default, you can you can turn it off if you want to. Um, yeah, all right. So now I will go into talking about the Tika Pipes module. So the goals are to isolate parsing uh, files into the into the own one one parse per process. Um, we want to keep the iterator, the command module, the client in a separate process, uh, and we want to keep and uh, generally want to keep parsing out of the index processes. We want to allow for uh, robust timeouts. We want to allow for really long parse times. Um, so, for example, if you nowadays, if you send a PDF, uh, a large PDF to uh, Tika server uh, and you run OCR on it, that can take longer than you can keep your HTTP client connection going. Um, so you're not going to get the response back uh, with Tika pipes. There's we, that problem is now solved and I'll, I'll show you what that looks like. So the notion is that we have um, at the at the bare minimum we have fetchers and emitters and uh, they're all configured in uh, XML files. I'll show you some of the examples of that. A fetcher is something that grabs an input stream and metadata uh, from some kind of source. So it could be an S3 uh, bucket, it could be your file, a local file share, uh, it could be um, a JDBC, um, it could be all sorts of different sources. An emitter uh, is where the where Tika sends the parsed file, the extracted text and metadata after it's finished parsing the file. So that could be Solar or OpenSearch or Elasticsearch. Um, and the key thing is that uh, with this process, uh, the client only sends kind of a, that fetching that tuple. It's not sending data anymore. And I'll, I'll show you how that uh, can become really useful in scaling. So this is what the fetcher looks like for a file system. Um, you give it a name and you tell it where to start. And then uh, the uh, client will send keys that, that start below that docs directory to get the actual files. Um, but we also, as I mentioned, have um, HTTP. So for URLs, uh, S3, uh, GCS, and, and we can certainly add others. Then uh, Tika does the parsing and then it ships off um, what was extracted. So uh, Dublin Core title, creator, content length, content, a bunch of other metadata fields typically as well. 
We've added metadata filters so that you can modify um, that extracted text. Uh, you can, this is an example of changing the uh, field names, which is really useful before you send it off to OpenSearch or uh, Solar. Um, so, you know, take the XT content field and just call it content, content likes be called length and so on. Um, and then uh, the Tika parse process will emit that individual document, uh, in this case to Solar, um, is the top one. And then we have a file system emitter uh, below, which will emit to um, will emit that extracted text to uh, your directory. All right, um, this is what the client sends. It's called a fetch emit tuple. So you specify which fetcher you want to use, what emitter you want to use, and what emit key you want to use. Um, so, you know, wh what do I call it in the, in the source? What do I call the raw bytes in the source? What do I want to call the output in the extract system? Uh, you can also, the client can inject um, provenance metadata or external metadata uh, in the metadata key. And then you can also tell um, the system what to do if there's a parse exception. Sometimes you want to emit that so that you can track your parse exceptions. Uh, other times you don't even want to send it on and you just want to log the error and, and move on. Um, all right, so we have some new endpoints in Tika server for these. Uh, one is called pipes and one is called async. Um, pipes, uh, you send a single command to pipes, uh, single fetching the tuple to pipes. It will, the server will fetch the bytes, do the parsing, and then emit the, um, emit the, the extracted text and then send a response for that particular file. With async, you can send a list of, of um, fetch emit tuples and async will farm those out to sub processes and take care of it. Um, you, there's currently no way to find out what happened to your stuff aside from logging, um, but the, it, async will handle those, those, those um, issues. Um, We'll, we'll handle that processing. And async is, is where you can now send a 100 page PDF and it will eventually get, get processed. All right, um, so those are some of the fetchers, some of the emitters. Okay, so what does this look like in process? So let's say we have a client uh, and um, that client uh, sends the fetching that tuple to Tika. Uh, Tika gets that JSON, sends the JSON into its uh, forked processes. So now the Tika server has a bunch of forked processes sends the, um, the, that fetch emit tuple down to those. It, each process will, will grab the bytes, in this case from S3, do the parsing, and then ship those off to Solar. If something goes wrong, that's fine. One, you have a bunch of other uh, fork processes. The other thing is the parent process is watching all of those fork processes, and it will simply restart that one. Uh, and if you're doing um, pipes, uh, the, the main process will send back and tell you that you, you crashed something. Um, and if you're sending async, it'll log what crashed it. Um, but but it's, it's much, much more robust uh, by, by breaking out um, all of the parsing one file per uh, JVM at a time. Right. And then, yeah, everything is back to normal and, and away we go. All right, so this is this, and so that's kind of the robust, robustness benefit of the new pipes module and the async and um, uh, pipes endpoint. Let's talk now about scaling and what, what you can do for um, scaling. So again, let's say you have a client with a bunch of documents. Um, they're all in S3 and you want to parse them and send them into solar. So now what happens currently with, or with, with the old Tika server is the client would be responsible for getting the bytes, shipping those bytes across the network to Tika, getting the text back or the JSON back, and then shipping that, doing some modification possibly and sending that off to solar. But that doesn't really scale extremely well because that one client is now, you know, grabbing all those bytes from S3, shipping all those bytes off the different Tika servers, getting all that stuff back and sending that off to solar. So what you can do now is one client can just send a whole bunch of these fetching the tuples to a pod of uh, Tika servers. Each one will go and grab the data, do the parsing, and, and ship those off to Solar. Uh, so it's a much cleaner um, architecture uh, than what we had before. Now, let me just stop here and say that if you already have Tika working robustly in Kafka or some other messaging queue or um, or batch processing with um, AWS Batch or um, any of these other big data um, processing things, this may not be great for you. Um, but what I've seen again and again, and the main contributor who helped with this uh, was living in was was our old Tika server land where a single client had to send all of had to fetch all of those bytes, ship them off to Tika, get the text back, and send them to Solar. So. I don't mean to suggest that this is going to, you know, get get rid of Hadoop or, or whatever your big data um, structure is now, platform is now, but this can be a really nice way to scale out um, these processes, especially in a Kubernetes cluster. Um, 
so that you're you're, you're not sh shipping all of those bytes around your network uh, for one thing, um, but also so that you're distributing the load um, in, a, in a much cleaner way. All right, so that's the um, that's scaling and, and how scaling can can be quite um, uh, improved by this. The other thing is for um, async, we are actually batching emits. Uh, the um, uh, Nicholas de Piazza, the, the main contributor or the main um, uh, co-creator uh, or co-designer of the um, Pipes uh, framework, um, uh, who works a lot with uh, Solar, knows, and we all know this, that if you send an individual document to Solar, you know, if you send documents individually to Solar, it's a whole lot slower than if you can batch them. Um, and because Tika doesn't go bad too often. Um, we wanted to be able to cache um, extracts, extracted text and, and metadata uh, before sending those off to Solar. So we have added this emit cache in the main process, which is separate from that, um, from that child process. So what will happen now in async, and it depends on what your settings are, um, you send the JSON request to uh, fetching the tuple to Tika. It will forward that to a, a spawned process, grab the bytes, parse the file, put those, put that um, JSON extract into the emit cache. That will keep going until it, until it hits a certain threshold. And then uh, a thread will determine that it's time to ship those all off to solar. And it will send then an array of JSON extracts to solar so that you're, you're being much more efficient with your network. You don't have to make a separate HTTP call for every uh, file that you're sending off to solar. And that still maintains the reliability of having that, having the parsing done in the, um, in the spawned process. Now, and, and obviously, you, you know, there, there are many spawn processes, so those are all going into um, a single emit cache that is a separate um, thread, uh, which, which monitors how, how um, full it is, and then we'll, we'll ship those, uh, that array of JSON extracts off to solar. So the other thing that can happen is that we have a, a threshold that if the JSON extract is, is too big, or as a user can set this, how, how big the JSON extract is. But let's say you have, you know, you're, you're going through your million files and all of a sudden you have some monster, you know, terabyte um, PDF. Um, and let's say you have enough memory to, to parse that thing. You don't want to send that back to the emit cache and risk destroying, uh, throwing the overall um, main process. Uh, into an OOM. So we do have a release valve that if you have, users can set the threshold, but if an extract is larger than X size, it will send it directly to solar. So it's not even bothering the emit cache. So it's a security, it's a memory safety feature um, for the emit cache. All right, so what we need to work on uh, quite a bit is uh, the uh, setting, the dependencies are not easily managed um, in solar. Uh, for example, you have a really nice thing where you can just add extra libs in the config file and Solar will load those in and everything will be magic. Um, at this point, users are required to drop the um, drop the dependencies into the class path for server or app to get everything to work. And that's a bit fiddly. And we, we're looking forward to ways to, we're looking forward to figuring out how to, how to make that easier uh, for folks. Um, parameters are actually pretty well set now, so I probably should have updated that slide a bit. But we're the main issue is is um, managing those dependencies and making sure that everything is, is where they belong. Um, there, we also have a uh, what's, what we're calling a um, a pipes iterator, and what that will do is uh, iterate through a bunch of files um, or um, either an S3 or, or wherever we have a number of um, uh, pipe iterators, um, or iterate through local files. And then it will automatically generate the fetch emit tuples and send those off so that you don't even have to be a client. You don't have to write your own client to do these basic things. Um, you can just call Tika app. If you're only running it on in a single um, process, you can go Tika app um, uh, and then specify your async settings, uh, what your file system pipe iterator is and so on. And Tika app will will you know, spawn a bunch of processes um, and run that uh, iterator through all of the input files and automatically generate the fetching the tuples and ship all of those off to, to where the files, where the extracts belong. Um, so that's uh, another handy thing that we have and that's available currently in Tika app. And we're looking to modify Tika batch to be this uh, probably not for a good while because it's there are some breaking things in it. But that is an alternative in Tika app now for running um, files either on a local directory, um, file share to file share, or now with the fetch and emitter, fetchers and emitters, you can now run Tika app on S3 and send that to Solar or Elasticsearch or OpenSearch. Um, so Tika app has now become a lot more powerful. 
All right, we still need a lot more integration tests. We need more performance testing. Um, we need, as I mentioned, we need to improve the packaging of jars, especially for Tika server. Um, we've got to have an InfiniDash into integration. Um, the, uh, sorry that we haven't gotten around to that yet. Um, uh, we need to improve documentation, of course. Um, basically, please join the fun. Uh, here's some links that will help you with um, you know, getting in touch with the project if you uh, want to do such a thing. Um, now, if I, I realize that we may have some uh, folks who love files uh, on this on this talk, uh, if you love files, I'm giving a talk next Wednesday at uh, PDF Association's PDF Days, um, and I'll talk about some of the fun things you can do with uh, 10 terabytes of PDFs uh, that um, I extracted from a Common Crawl uh, poll. And these are this is the the map of PDFs as as mapped from the URLs that they came from. Anyways, that's next Wednesday. But seriously, let's go to uh, questions. Um, and I will look at the chat. Sorry, my dual monitors aren't quite as neatly arranged as they should be. Um, so uh, Daniel asked, can uh, Tika fetch the JSON job files from queues automatically? Um, I think that the, uh, the, 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 the pipes iterators are, are kind of along those lines and you could write your own pipes iterators. We currently have them on JDBC um, file shares. Uh, we even have one on solar. so. The main um, uh, Nick, Nicholas Di Piazza, his process was to um, in, ingest uh, the easy to get metadata from certain files into Solar and then iterate through Solar to say, have I run Tika against the actual content of those files? So we even have a fetch iterator um, for Solar uh, that is based on certain um, fields in, in Solar um, to, to pull from there. So. Yeah, and, and you can also send, um, you can, we also have a CSV iterator, so you can have a list of uh, jobs in CSV file, or as I said, JDBC. Um, I think we even have just a file list, a, a te .text file. So if you need a JSON um, uh, fetch uh, pipes iterator, um, we can certainly easily add, add that. Just let us know. Anchum, how are you doing? I don't see anything in Q&A. Anyways, um, oh dear, Robert Muir is here. How are, anything else uh, that you'd like to chat about with Tika or more robust parsing? All right, yes, yeah, so which types of file shares do Tika support? Um, so Tika currently, as I mentioned, um, for fetching uh, S3, um, Google Cloud Storage, uh, local file share, uh, and uh, HTTP uh, URLs. Um, I came across, was it min.io? Somebody suggested something like that. Uh, so there's some interest in that, at least by one person on Twitter, which isn't enough for me to do anything about it yet. Um, somebody also mentioned Samba potentially. Um, so it, it's, it's pretty straightforward. The interface for the fetchers is pretty straightforward and it's pretty easy to add those. All right, uh, how long does it take to run the core pro? Um, Thank you, Daniel. Um, so how long does it take to run the corporate? Typically, it takes uh, something like four hours uh, to run against. It's, it's getting longer. Um, it's, it's somewhere between like four to six hours to run a single run of Tika against that much data. Um, it's multi-threaded, uh, but it takes about that long. So we run you know, the current version of Tika, and then we run the, 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 the candidate version of Tika. And then uh, we run, then it takes another probably two hours to do, to run Tika eval, which goes through all of the files pairwise and uh, measures how much difference there is in the content um, and also measures uh, different, uh, whether there was a, uh, an exception in, in the new parser versus the old parser, um, uh, measures um, uh, crashes and, and other things. So that's on the, it typically takes, wall clock about a full day um, to, to do that uh, regression testing. Can Tika join between multiple files? I have a zip file that contains multiple XMLs that have relationship IDs uh, between the different files. Uh, yeah, no SFTP, I'll jump to the next question. Not yet, um, but that can certainly be easily added. Just you know, stop off at our JIRA, open up an issue, and I don't think that should be a problem. Um, can Tika join between multiple files? So with, if you have a zip file with XML files, um, no. Uh, you would have to build your own parser to do that, and you know we we that that is effectively what a docx file is, xlsx and pptx. They are just you know structured XML within a zip file. Um, writing your own Tika parser to handle that is pretty straightforward, but we currently don't have a way to uh, for you to specify how to join XML files within a zip file. 
Um, yeah, I think that's about it. Anything else? I'm happy to stick around. I know that I uh, ended a little bit early, but have, should give people more time to have a break before the next next talk. Got to have this up. Um, all right. Well, thank you all for joining me. If you do have uh, questions, you can um, find me on the, the mailing list. Uh, you can find me on uh, Twitter, uh, all sorts of places. Um, and if you do care about PDFs, um, my talk next week should be fairly entertaining. Uh, and again, if you do care about PDFs, uh, Peter Wyatt's uh, Peter Wyatt has two talks um, at PDF Association's PDF Days. I think next Tuesday, and then one the following week. Um, and those should also be very good. All right. Anyways, it looks like there's nothing else in the chat. Let me just quickly check Q&A. Nope, nothing there either. So anyways, thank you all so much. Onwards uh, and happy ApacheCon at home 2021. Thank you so much. <laughs>